right, whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, Steve, just for the rest of Steve, Steve's holding us up. He's holding up the start time. Just, you know, if he wants two minutes at the end, just get away. <laughs> right. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin work session for November 7th, 2018. I have November 6th written down, but it is, in fact, November 7th. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so this evening, uh, we are actually going to skip our announcements for now and get back to them because we have a very short time um, with our planner, David Stolman from FP Clark. And we wanted to just jump right into the discussion about our solar code. Um, and he's being pulled in a couple directions because he actually has a planning board meeting to attend since it is Wednesday, not Tuesday, since the election day last night. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but right now um, we'd love to just sort of jump into some of the revisions that have been made to the solar code um, since the last time, some of the feedback that we received, and then try to get um, some comments from the board to see if we can move forward a little bit. Um, uh, Christy Tamadana had taken notes from our last meeting and sent them off to David um, about some of the things that we were considering. And I don't know if you wanted to make any comments first about any of those and how you might have um, thought we could incorporate them or not be valuable to incorporate them, and then the board can kind of have further discussion and we can go from there. Sure. If you don't mind, I actually came to talk about that. So okay, so we're this is a work session okay. as it is. So a work session. Um, we have public hearings okay. specifically for the public to weigh in. Okay. But this being a work session, it's only an opportunity for our, the board to talk amongst ourselves. So, um, so every time we listen. have, you get to listen, and then mm -hmm. the, we will have another public hearing, um, and that will be an opportunity for you to come back and talk to us. Um, feel free to grab us after the meeting if you'd like to just grab bend our ear about this right now sure. or to send us any of your comments in writing um, you can email those to me at d levenberg at com, which is um, that's a typical email available on okay. the website or okay. I think it's TC TC. Uh, TC gets all of us at once which is TC, so be town TC, Council, what? TC at town of dot com or just D Levenberg at townbossing.com. Thank you. Um, so yes, and we're happy to continue to take, take comments, but we have been talking about the solar code for a number of months now. I think we started before the summer, I want to say, maybe June. Um, and we've been talking about it. We've had a lot of feedback. We've had feedback from developers. We've had, we've had feedback from uh, residents. We've had feedback from uh, environmentalists, and we kind of heard from a number of different perspectives, and now we're continuing our deliberation. Um, and we do feel like I think we're getting to the end because we have received very many comments. I actually had the opportunity to go see a number of solar installations, large solar installations in Orange County last Friday, was it? Saturday. Friday? It was Friday. Um, two Fridays. Was it? Two Fridays. Oh, two Fridays. Friday. <laughs> in the recent past. Past Friday. Um, in any case, oh, maybe it was two Fridays. <laughs> Oh, you're right, it was two Fridays ago. In any case, um, so it was two Fridays ago, and what I did learn is that we're in pretty good shape um, with our solar code, and, and I had an opportunity to send our current draft to New York Sun, which is part of NYSERDA, um, and they took a look at it um, to see if there's anything they gave us, some sort of housekeeping comments, I guess, mm -hmm. um, which I had also forwarded to David. So, okay, David, you're now on. Okay, so I, I apologize, but I have about nine minutes yes. to go through this fast, and I'm happy to come back and talk to you whenever, whenever you'd like. Okay. So starting with the NYSERDA comments, um, there, there were a couple of things, and they truly are housekeeping, and I think not in a derogatory way, but I think um, the comment is a little obsessive in terms of where things are located, but I can easily amend the, it's not substantive at all, so I can easily amend the local law that way. And then the gentleman recommended leaving all roof map and solar projects in Tier 1 um, as opposed to uh, some in Tier 2 and Tier 3. 
virtually all of the roof-mounted solar would be in tier one. Uh, in tier two, I you know we talked about having roof-mounted perhaps on um, accessory. Well, on um, large or multiple roofs, right? You multiple said roofs, like right. um, carports, like in a in a large parking lot or something. Mm -hmm. And um, if this the roof mounted would be on one more than one building. I put that in tier two, my thinking being that we might want site plan approval for that. And if it was on more than 900 square feet of multiple buildings, I put it in tier three because I figured we would perhaps want a conditional use permit and site plan approval for those. So it's really a matter of scale and, and, and which tier they go in. But for um, the general, for the average single family home or, or single building, it would be tier three to go to the building inspector for a permit. Um, so that was, that did you remember? Did he have some reasons? I can't remember now. Um, why his, he wanted that? I got his email right here. Okay. It says recommend leaving all roof-mounted solar projects in tier one, as many of the ground mount requirements in tier two and three will not be relevant, such as site setbacks and location. He's absolutely right about that. But those won't apply anyway. It's just the process. Uh, tier two is subject to site plan approval. Tier three, the solar firms are subject to getting a conditional use permit and site plan approval from the planning board. So the uh, more grand the scale of roof, the rooftop, the more process there would be. So just, can, just for an that. example, I'm just like, let's just think, we'll talk through it a little bit. Like if Mariel, for example, wanted to put solar panels on. Uh, on their buildings. On their buildings. All mm -hmm. their buildings. Right. They would have to, that would be considered tier three? Uh, depending upon the size. It would depend upon the size of the, the total amount of square footage. Right. Of the roof mounted uh, solar panels. Okay. And not that they have said that. I'm just, I'm just using that as like sort of an example. You know, that they'd have to go through a lot more comp complex process if they wanted to do roof mounted on a number of buildings. Right. There would be an assumption requirement in tier two, isn't there? 110%. This is not going to go very quickly. Okay. Let me finish all these comments and let's. Well, I'm not here to make trouble. I just made a comment. <laughs> it's just not. It, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm sorry. It's just not. It isn't our process. That's all. I mean, we're, we're not having a conversation with the public. It, it, that's absolutely an opportunity is at public hearing, and I appreciate your comments and that your your desire to participate. But we just have a short time with our planner, so we just want to make the, the most of him right now. Okay. Uh, okay. So anyway, um, we can I guess continue to talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it's just really a matter of process. Mm -hmm. And um, he was saying, the gentleman at Nice Circle was saying that they shouldn't be Tier 2 or Tier 3 because Tier 2 and 3 are ground mounted, but it was really the process. And if the process is okay, we can still certainly tweak things such that we're talking, it's clear we're only talking about process, we're not talking about requirements, right. like height and setback. Right? No, and I understand that, but I my my feeling, and I could be wrong, is that he was trying to say that, like, let's make the process easier for roof mounted, because that should be sort of like more seamless. Like, why make a whole hullabaloo about it and have to go through these extra requirements in terms of said. process? That's not what he said. He said that it, they should be tier one because the ground mounted requirements in tiers two and three are not. Okay. All right. Stated right. reason. Right, but we know that tier so, one, the process is simpler. Yes, just the building permit. Right. So right. we could say in tier two, if ground mounted, then you need your setbacks at the distance. No, but his whole point is no. any roof mounted. I, I understand that. I, I'm saying something different. I, I did, but. Okay. Um, but it, so. But the, the way to deal with that mm -hmm. relative to his concern is to just say we're talking about process, we're not talking about. The height, setback, right. etc. requirements. Okay. But um, if we wanted to make it easier for all roof, roof mounted, mounted, we could keep them in tier one, and they right. just get the building uh, a permit from the building inspector. Okay, so we can talk about that amongst ourselves. Yeah. After you left, sure. after you leave, right? Um, so just you guys, mm -hmm. all here, we will discuss that. Okay. Okay. Roof mounted, where we want it to be, if we want to make it easier for people. Those okay. are his comments. Yep. Okay. Um, Donna Sherritt. Mm -hmm commented that um, she was objecting to the uh, maximum impervious surface coverage of 35%. She was calling it building coverage. It's not really building coverage. It's just maximum 
impervious surface coverage. Mm -hmm. And um, she was essentially saying that that would result in more impervious surface than a subdivision. But the building coverage in the residential zoning districts ranges from 18% to 30%. And when you add in sidewalks and driveways and patios and sports courts and that kind of thing, the impervious surface coverage goes easily up to 35%. So we're not out of bounds. We're not out of, out of the range of reason there in saying the maximum impervious surface for solar panels is 35%. That leaves plenty of room for at least 65 percent of the lot for landscaping and buffers and that kind of thing. Okay. So it's, I think it's very reasonable. Um, she was saying that there should be um, landscaping maintenance requirements or um, uh, a covenant or something like that. We can certainly include that. When a site plan gets approved by the planning board, they have to maintain the landscaping in a healthy and vigorous growing condition throughout the duration of the use of the site and replace any vegetation that's not so maintained with comparable, comparable vegetation at the beginning of the next growing season. So that's just a requirement. There's a note on every site plan that says that. But we can easily also include landscape maintenance requirements or some sort of agreement that the applicant enters into. There's no Which problem. I think is a good idea. Um, because, and it's something that we definitely, I heard about as I was on this tour, that that was something that was worth including. Again, even though it's already really in there as, as are, I think, a lot of other requirements from, mm -hmm. um, that are part of site plan approval process, right? Right, right. Okay. It's just a routine requirement. And if they don't maintain their landscaping on any site plan, uh, as per the site plan, John Hamilton, Hamilton can easily go out there, issue them a violation, and they'll have to replace their landscaping with comparable vegetation at the beginning of the next growing season. Um, Donna was suggesting that the minimum lot size for tier three solar farms should be at least four acres. I think that's absolutely fine. As a practical matter, they're going to need 20 acres or, or, or more for a, a viable solar farm. So that could easily be changed to four acres without any, any harm whatsoever. Okay. Um, height. I guess there was some discussion about sheep grazing under the solar panels. So yeah, this wasn't discussed. This was a discussion not with the board, but this was something that came up again on my little tour. Um, one of apparently one of the most the the best ways to take care of landscaping is um, to have animals eat the grass, um, and the best animals to do that are considered sheep, uh, according to some of the folks that were up there and talking. So that theoretically could be a low cost way to maintain the landscape. And the only You do have to feed them. You do. <laughs> Even uh, above the grass that they're eating. Yes, so. there's, you know, there's the, yes, but the thing about it is then that- Then aren't there some farm codes we'd have to take at? So, okay, Dave, do you wanna talk about that part? The farm codes? The, so the, co so we actually have in our um, town code permits um, and, um, up to six sheep per acre, but only in residential districts. Um, so the only thing that they noted again on this on this tour was that you want to make sure that you allow enough height so that the solar panels can be mounted at a height where the sheep can still get under it. So that's why it has it has an impact. Okay, let's, have, let's finish with our planner and, and talk about that after. <laughs> No, I mean, well, that's, okay, you want, okay. no, I was just that, I, I mean, it's I the height to above the 15 feet that we just, no, changed. I don't think it would be, it would need to be above the 15 feet. I just need, I think it needs to be 15 feet. It don't, you don't want it to go lower than that because the size of the panels themselves and, and proportionally where they would end up. I mean, most of the ones that I saw actually were lower, but they talked about how they were too low than if you wanted right. to have sheep. 15 feet, you could elevate them sheep. enough. If you want, yeah. Yeah, because the sheep will get squashed. Yeah, they won't get under, they won't be able to do their job. Of course not. You know. Yeah, so I know it's funny, but but it's interesting. Um, it's just it's just you know again it's potential, and then we'd have to um, adjust it to allow. They eat our pollinators. I don't think that the sheep would eat the bees. I the meant the flowers bees? that we planted for them. I don't okay. I don't know the All answer. Right. I think Go it's ahead. a good it's a good symbiotic relationship according to the people who were sort of like the most versed in this. That okay. that was something that they had talked about. I know it sounds funny, but it's just you know a lot of a lot of the area that we were looking at was in Orange County. A lot of the area that that they're talking about is 
farmland. So, right. So that you know, they're kind of more used to dealing with We're talking a lot farm about shrubbery for screening and trees and right. planting flowers and other mm-hmm. things for birds and bees underneath. And I feel like sheep really like those right. things. I think one of the other things that Donna had brought up was uh, screening, the, screening, the height right. of the... And with, with a maximum impervious surface coverage of 35%, and at least 65% of the site open, you should be able to have plenty of buffer and landscaping with space interior to that for the solar panels. So there shouldn't be any problem with landscaping and screening of the solar panels and, and, and not interfering with the solar panels themselves. And I, feel, I mean, again, it's like a balancing act. So you want to, I mean, it has to be something that's worthwhile for a solar developer to even right. attempt to do. And you have this uh, floating zone that is being proposed, and you've got extreme latitude with respect to your authority. And if you find a site that, because of the topography, doesn't work with the landscaping and the screening, you still see the solar panels, you can reject that site uh, very easily. Um, And that was really the extent of it. Right. Does anybody have any questions for David? Because he's going to have to leave this instant, pretty much. I've got um, free memos. So 15 feet seems appropriate. That's fine for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. I like it much better now. Free to go? You're free. You're Have fun with the planning board. Oh, we'll talk. the police say that. We'll talk amongst ourselves. And well, then we're gonna the get police said somebody out in the parking lot, so you might want to go no, slowly. I saw that. Yeah. I'll try uh, to avoid them. Okay. So invite me back, and I'm happy to come and spend okay. more time with you. So... If after this discussion there are not going to be any major substantive changes to pros local law, hopefully David could incorporate any additional comments or changes based upon the board's discussion, and then we can send the general municipal law referral to the county and the public hearing notices to the neighboring municipalities was uh, Christy's suggestion. So we will um, go from there if we have any additional anything additional from our discussion. And we'll talk about the roof mounted. Um, being in tier one versus just leaving it as is the way we have it now, and sheep. we can talk about sheep and other things. Okay. So would you want to give me a call soon to let me know yes. what comes out of the meeting tonight? Yes, great. we'll call you soon. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Thank have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk for a little bit more on this and see if we can come to some kind of a general consensus, um, and then we will have another opportunity for the public to weigh in because we will have another version of this which would then um, be open to the public for comment and input would you like to talk about sheep no not really are you guys good then with those with the sort of I don't know where does anybody have an opinion about the roof mounted being in tier one I I mean the only advantage I I think to that recommendation is to make it easier for people to do roof mounted I don't know, Steve. Do you you know you haven't really been part of the, these conversations with us? But if you have any insight from anything else that you've worked on, um, that you want to add to the conversation, you know, this is a, a relatively new thing, and I haven't seen a lot of it. I think you know the point that David made, if I understood it correctly, was really that tier two and tier three require a little bit more uh, review. Um, tier one was intended for effectively single-family homes where if somebody wanted to put a couple of panels on their roof, they could come and get a building permit. Whereas if you're talking about uh, multiple buildings or a large uh, set of panels, that there maybe should be more oversight. And, and I think that's sounded to me like you thought it ought to be left out of tier one. Right. But obviously that's your call. Can we put it in tier one and have caveats for certain sizes or certain well, that's what that's, that's what point. it has now. That's what it is by putting it in tier if two. If it gets that three. big, then we put it in tier two, and the planning board should look at it. And if right. it gets monster, then I mean, I'm just the, thinking of like Terra Tile, for example. Like Terra Tile probably exceeded the amount that would you know would have to have gone through the planning board review. Oh, yeah. So you could have you know a, a building with large roof and. That would, you know, and again, this is getting back to what is the, the other requirements. Um, and the, um, I, I just, I'm, I guess I'm just questioning, do we want to make it easier or harder for people? It, if it's on the roof that's already been approved within the plan for the building, is there is there a reason? I mean, that has to go through a review anyway. Here, here it says, 
tier two ground mounted where total surface area of all solar panels do not exceed 900 square feet solar energy system does not generate more than 110 percent of the electricity consumed on the site over the previous 12 month period that's tier two um so again i i, I mean i don't know or do we want to make it easier or harder that's i guess that's the big question i think you want to make it easier that's what i think mm -hmm. that's what i'm putting out there yeah no we want to make it easier for people to do roof mounted or do we like what's you know somebody already has a roof it's their roof they want to put solar panels on their roof okay and tier one has the glare in it already still right those are the definitions mm -hmm. The other thing is, if you think that the way it is too restrictive and you want to perhaps allow something that's a little bit larger, and maybe you can change it that way, uh, but still, if it's going to be gigantic, you might want to have Okay, go ahead. Okay, think about the Tesla solar roof. They're not like solar panels. Right. So, so they take up much more than 900 square feet. They take up the whole roof, or a good chunk of it. Yeah, that's and a good I, point. And we haven't even talked about that. I mean, that's not even considered a solar panel, really. That's even a different, that's a, a roofing tile, essentially, right? Uh, it'll, it'll fit the definition of solar, solar system, right. this thing. Right. So, and that's, and that's a good point because, in fact, that's the direction that the industry is going. So, if we, again, are, you know, are we going to cut off our nose to spite our face kind of thing? Are we going to lock ourselves into something that's very restrictive yeah. when? Well, we can always change it. We can, but it's a, a long process to change it. That. So, you know, I almost think that, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like for, I think we should go with the recommendation of New York Sun and leave roof mounted out of tier two and tier three and have all roof mounted be a part of tier one. So so the objective is to save more energy and the, the objective is to do, you know, is sustainability. So the harder we make it, the less people are gonna take advantage of it. So That's true. I think that to me, it, I'm not seeing any right. reason why you would want to make it harder. I'd like to try it less restrictive, and then if we find that there's some, we've just made some huge mistake, and there's some eyesore in the town well, that's the, as a saying. result. And can we make it subject to? I no, mean, that's, that's the that's whole the point. Problem. You can't no. see, but but, but, the but this is the thing. Like we already know what, <laughs> what they look like, of? and the Tesla, the but Tesla changing. Yeah, but the test, better. they're changing to be more like regular roof tiles. So the change right. is going in the direction of making the test. Yeah, but you don't know which way they're going to change after that. I mean, okay, but, but we also don't know what's going to happen if we, you know, like. Wait, that, all right, you, I get it. You, you could do, feel? that could be true of the, the roof tile industry overall. I mean, so. It could be purple. I, anyway. You know, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to make it less restrictive. Because you already know what they look like now and the trend is to make them less obtrusive and more um, cosmetically pleasing because that's what's going to be more marketable. I, I mean, I, I feel like that's a good recommendation is to put the roof mounted into tier one. And like I said, if, if for some reason we suddenly find that we've made a mistake with some property and there's a huge eyesore suddenly well, We still in the have town, the anti-glare in there for the neighbors. Yeah, I don't. I don't okay. think that the glare is actually a problem. They don't really. They don't really have a lot of glare to them. Um, that's that's you know another thing that was like sort of a fallacy, I think. But um, nevertheless, yes, it's in there. So I don't. I'm not sure what the horror of solar panels is. I don't know that there is any. I'm just. I, I mean. The, again, just, oh, the, with the ones, you know, we're talking about ground-mounted systems, solar farms, larger installations, I get it. But when you're talking about it's on a roof, okay. it's already in existence, I, I think. And the building permit would check that the roof is structurally sound yes. that much. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. You can't, so you can't put them on roofs that aren't um, structurally sound. And not to mention that the company doesn't want to put it on a roof that's not structurally right. sound either. The installers don't you, want to do you that. Need, you, know? you, need, you need a good roof to put them on. Right. You can't I'm put them on a bad that, yeah. roof. Yeah. Okay. So right. 
we like this idea then of moving the roof mount at all to tier one. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so. Okay, and everybody else is good with the, um, we're gonna add the landscaping requirement in to be part of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? We're okay with the minimum lot size to be at least four acres, mm -hmm. okay? And we're going to leave as is with the 35% of mm -hmm. um, the total, mm -hmm. yes, um, whatever, acreage. And if there's no other comments, then I think we'll have that, um, we'll have David make those um, tweaks. There's one other housekeeping thing that I think this guy from New York Sun suggested, and um, we'll put it back up on the website for comments, and we'll have another public hearing on November 20th? No, that's our work session. Next week, November 13th, at our next meeting. You're going to have to do, once you have that revised, you're going to have to do the GML. Right, right, right. So we'll do that at the same time, we'll, or should we wait? We don't want to have the public hearing next week, is that what you're saying? Well, it, has it already been adjourned to the 13th? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you might as well go ahead, but I would say as soon as you can get Same the GML time. notices out, because you've got to give 30 days notice to okay. the county. Okay. All right. So we'll do that. All right. Fantastic. We're going to allow sheep. I, oh, yeah. And that's the other question. I mean, I, I think, again, it could be a, an advantage. It's, I think, a I mean, I know I like the idea approach. for goats to clear out some of the other stuff, so. So they said sheep are better than goats. That's why sheep, for some reason, I can't remember. They're shorter. What they no, there's fit. actually there is a reason. Their they goats are I don't know louder or something. There's they something. have those horns and that could, you know, they could snag. Yeah, snag on hit, the, hit, hit, yeah. A, hit one of the cells. The sheep are fuzzy and they're like less okay. abrasive. They have to be. Okay, and I'm not going to this. Okay. If you're gonna have sheep. Not in the code. Um, you know, the, the, the one cutting effectively. Right. We're also putting a provision in for uh, for screening. Uh, it's just a, th a thought. Does it make sense to require that uh, there be a, a certain depth of screening separating the sheep from the perimeter of the property, so you don't wind up with issues about the sheep uh, eating the screening? Interact well, interacting with the people. <laughs> well, I think you have to have it. I think they usually fence them. In. I, I think, think I think you're gonna have to add some fencing if you're putting those sheep okay, in there. Okay, so sheep with appropriate uh, uh, protections. Buffer zone beyond sheep pen. protections. Scrabbles we'll say. Who will? Scrabbles the bear. Oh, there okay, you. the bear. Okay, with appropriate the protections. They okay. Like them. Uh, okay. So we're we're good with the sheep, with appropriate protections. Uh, we will move. The roof mount, all roof mount to tier one. We have the landscaping requirement and minimum lot size at least four acres. And that's I think for tier two or for tier three? It's for tier, tier three. And that's it, right? right. We're not actually going to put sheep in the code, are we? Kind of no, we, I think we do because it's right now sheep are only allowed in residential, so they would be allowed in for a solar farm only. You're subject to, to revision. But I could see somebody putting on a couple of panels and saying, you know what, I'll put two more panels on. And that'll double it. That won't be a 5% increase. You might want to look into that. Okay. Thank you. Is there, is there a cap on the number of sheep, or is there an appropriate number well, there, of sheep? Well, I think we could follow the code that we have, which is six per something acre, or two acres, or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it six per acre? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we could just stick with our own code and just say that we would allow them in this, you know, for a solar farm if okay. that was desirable to the developer. Okay. Um, a couple of panels. I have to say, I did like the idea of the uh, pollinating plants underneath. Yeah, I think that's in there, though, isn't it? It is. Yeah, but the I pollinating feel like if plants. Believe them. I don't think so because they were very into the pollinating plants. But we can look into that. Okay. okay. Sheep resistant pollinating plants. Question. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, both work, but maybe. Well. <laughs> but maybe it's an either or, you know, like maybe you have pollinating plants or and then or don't. you have sheep. That makes more sense. I feel like that's probably it. I don't know if it's an either or, so that's what we'll see if I can find that out, okay? okay. Yeah, you look into that. Yeah. I'm what was your that. name? <laughs> Carlos. Okay. All right. So, where are we up to next? Um, yeah, thank you. I'm going to do my announcements. What? Oh, okay, great. Okay, so first of all, I want to congratulate all of those newly elected and reelected officials who won in yesterday's election, and in particular, our own councilwoman, Jackie Shaw. We Yay. are excited that the public will have the benefit of your excellent representation for the next three years. Thank you very much. At a minimum. Uh, congratulations also to our local Village of Austin winners, Mayor Victoria Garrity, Trustee Rika Levin, and soon to be trustee once again, Manuel Quesada. We look forward to continuing to work together with you for our entire community. Also, congratulations to our re-elected State Assemblywoman Sandy Galef and Senator David Carlucci. We are blessed to have great relationships with both of them as well and hope to continue that for the next two years at least. I would also like to thank those who ran for public office but did not win at the polls yesterday. As all of us know, it takes a lot to put yourself out there before the public and mount a campaign and you're to be congratulated uh, for taking the time, money, and energy to do so. We had the opportunity to exercise our constitutional rights to vote, and many more than usual did so yesterday, and that speaks to an engaged public, which is great for all of us. Also, I would like to congratulate our own Victoria Caffarelli, who is not with us tonight because she is with the Village on their regular meeting night. Um, she was the Austin Rotary's Town Employee of the Year, nominated by us for 2018. Today is Victoria Caffarelli Day in the town of Austin. So please take the time to congratulate this young woman who started working for the town in 2015 and has brought so much added value to her work including her great job yesterday as the interim town village clerk with our elections. Um, also, congratulations to Victoria and to the town for securing another urban forestry grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Con Conservation to finish off the tree inventory for the town. We just learned of that Monday, I think. We were awarded $50,000 for this, so stay tuned. The Rotary held a lovely event this year to raise money for scholarships for Austin High School seniors. At the event, the Village of Austin Employee of the Year uh, was named Police Officer Emily Hershowitz, who also had a long list of accolades, and Allison Robbins from the library, and Lynn Alfarano from the Austin School District. Congratulations to all of these accomplished women. We are so proud and lucky to have them working here in the town and village. And congratulations to Lynn Alfarano on her retirement. We also had the chance to talk a little about the Austin Basics Collective Impact Campaign to improve all children's chances of starting school and even pre-K ready to learn. This month's basic is truly important for all of us. Maximize love, manage stress, please pass it on. As I, manage, as I mentioned in the update sent out from my office last Friday, last week was an incredibly solemn one for our nation. As we stood by in horror and watched the news detail the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh last Saturday. I know I speak for the entire town board when I say our hearts go out to all those families who lost loved ones and to the injured. On Saturday, many of us attended a service at Congregation Sons of Israel in Briarcliff. It was an opportunity to show our solidarity with those of all religions to reject hatred and intolerance. I learned that both the rabbi and Cantor at CSI personally knew the clergy from Pittsburgh, so it hit particularly close to home for them as well. With this incident, the ache struck deeply for me personally. I am the daughter of a hidden child. My mother was hidden on a farm in Holland in 1945, separated from her parents shortly after her grandfather was taken by the Nazis to perish in a concentration camp. I'm the beneficiary of Righteous Christians. This family and others who saved my grandparents put their own lives on the line to save others from the persecution they faced solely because of their beliefs. I have lived in freedom in the United States of America, a country that was born out of the rejection of religious persecution. Instead, the last couple of years in the U.S., we've been living with rhetoric coming from top government officials that has bred hatred and persecution, singling out those seeking to make better lives for themselves, putting others down to prop themselves up and making heroes out of haters. 
I believe to a large extent the results of yesterday's election go counter to this rhetoric for which I am very thankful. We need to come together and demand that we all speak the language of peace and tolerance, love and unity, and break down barriers instead of building them up, and recognize that our diversity of beliefs and ethnicities is a strength of ours, not a weakness, something to be celebrated, rather than purged. We mourn for those lost, and we mourn the loss of leadership that demands the best, not the worst in others, and hope that yesterday we were able to reinstate some of those who do demand that, and that we are able to use this moment in time to redirect our efforts, support one another, and make our country rich again in the morals and values we have come to expect with the Stars and Stripes. Last week's first of Fears Redux did take place Friday night. I know for a fact that those who attended were not disappointed. The cast and crew and those in charge, specifically Fern Quesada, with help from Jamie Eady and Mike Santiago and our wonderful Parks crew, are to be congratulated for their incredible creativity. They did an amazing job transforming town property to a fantastic haunt, replete with lighting, sound effects, great acting, and scares galore. We will be regrouping soon to figure out how we can make sure this event continues to be an added value to our town and recreation offerings next year and in the years to come. Today we embarked on a project that has been in talks for many years, the repaving of Hawks Avenue. Our highway department worked closely with Peckham on a reclamation of the road today and will continue that tomorrow. Friday we're hoping to lay down a new top coat to complete and seal the road. If the weather is not in our favor, we hope to complete the job on Saturday morning. If you live in the area and cannot avoid using Hawks, please do, your, do leave yourself plenty of extra time to get in and out of your home. If not, try to find alternative paths to your destination until the project is complete. I was out there this morning and this is a very interesting process which has been used by many neighboring municipalities for road work, including just at the end of Hawks on Spring Valley Road in Newcastle. We are hopeful the end product will satisfy even the pickiest and that we will have a brand new improved road that will serve travelers for many years to come. And on to more fun things. This Saturday, November 10th, join Green Austin for their Repair Cafe between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. at the Joseph Caputo Community Center. Their experts can help you repair clothing, ceramics, costume jewelry, bikes, and even electronics. Just new gas-powered items, please. Why replace when you can reuse? Got a few little ones in your house with energy to burn? Bring them to T-Town on Saturday for Rabbit Hop between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. This is a great opportunity for families with children between three and five years old to learn about and meet T-Town's rabbit family before making tails and ears to help you fight, fit right in. So get hopping. Uh, visit ttown.org to register. Also this Saturday, November 10th at 6.30 p.m., the Austin Arts Council will host their second annual Super Supper fundraiser at the Steamer Firehouse Gallery at 117 Main Street. Come enjoy some delicious hearty soups with friends and neighbors and take a unique handcrafted bowl home with you. Only a limited number of bowls will be available, so be sure to get your tickets ahead of time at austinartscouncil.org. On Thursday, November 15th, the Austin Documentary and Discussion Series will host a screening of Plastic Paradise, a documentary about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Did you know that the largest plastic accumulation zone on Earth, or the GPGP, covers an area twice the size of Texas in the ocean between Hawaii and California? How did this happen? What can we do to fix it? Learn more next Thursday in the Budars Theater beginning at 6.30 p.m. The film will be followed by a panel discussion, and this event is free to the public. Opening that very evening is of Aliens and Avocados, a series of one-act readings at the Westchester Collaborative Theater beginning the evening of Thursday the 15th and lasting through the afternoon of Sunday the 18th. Come see seven original pieces written by local folks and performed right here in Austin at wctheater.org for tickets. On the evening of Friday, November 16th, check out Denis, Denis Bonet, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, live at the Steamer Firehouse at 117 Main Street. Denny is not only a singer-songwriter, but an electric violinist, and she has toured and recorded with artists like Cindy Lauper, R.E.M., and Sarah McLaughlin. Doors open at 7.15 for an 8 o'clock show. Tickets are $20 each, $15 if you're an, an Austin Arts Council member, and are available at AustinArtsCouncil.org. Tickets are still avail available for the Sing, Sing, Swing, Up the River Cruise, leaving from Yonkers to benefit the Sing, Sing Prison Museum, which I think they just got their... Um, 
rights to that name official today or yesterday or this past week. This year's event is on Sunday, November 18th from 1 to 5, and I can hardly wait. Vince Giordano and the Nighthawks will be there to get you on your feet with their big band sounds, so I hope you'll join me for a night of Dancing on the Hudson with proceeds going to a very important local effort. And um, that's it for now. I'll talk about what we're closed when we're closed at the end of my Peter and the Star Catcher. Yeah. Peter and the Star Catcher is Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night starting at 7 p.m. Um, pre performed by Austin High School Drama <laughs> Club, and um, it is bound to be fantastic as all their productions are. I'll be there Friday night. Hope to see you then. And it's free. Uh, donations are welcome. You can purchase a reserved seat if you'd like for $15 at show tix the number four the letter u dot com probably also can find it through the um, Austin high school website is my guess anything else other announcements all right so in that case we are now going to do something interesting that we have never tried before um, we have been working on a project through a grant that we um, received through the Department of State, which is a shared <laughs> services grant through their local government efficiencies group, um, to evaluate if there are some ways that we could continue on a path that was started by others before us um, to find efficiencies in government and find ways to reduce our overhead costs. Um, some of those um, suggestions for areas that we are looking into were published on a website called Project Forward or Project Forward, T O O dot com, where it's available on um, a website that was created specifically for um, people who live in the town of Austin, townwide, to take a look and evaluate what they thought of some suggestions that have come forth. Um, we had put out a survey, we sent out a postcard to everybody who lives in the town general, and uh, we received a number of um, responses to that and we had hired Michael Conti um, um, as our communications consultant to work with us on this project and he is going to be with us via Skype. Is he here with us now? He's not because I didn't want the dial tone to be very loud. Oh. So we're going to get him on Skype and he's going to not know now unless he was watching us on TV which maybe he, oh he couldn't because we're not live. Um, he's not going to know what I just said so he may repeat what I just said. Then we're going to have take a look at a presentation that he's put together and, um, and talk a, a little bit about next steps as part of Pro Project Forward Phase 1. So I think we're going to have to slide over a little bit, Karen or Liz or somebody, like slide one direction or another. Great. And we'll see if this is going to work. I don't know if he's going to be able, is he going to be able to see us? How are he's going to be able to see you. Oh, through that little camera right there. Um, Oops. I'm doing it. Okay, do it. That's him. We're, hope we're hoping that's him. <laughs> Michael Conti, are you there? If it's not him. We won't be able to talk intelligently about the project. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Yeah. Please leave a message after the beep. Okay. Wait. So what happened when you just tried to put the phone number? It's making us pay for it because it's saying he's not on Skype if we're using the number instead of his little. Uh, well, do we know the number on that he can call us or not? We I did. Asked him to do just that. What? We did practice this earlier. We did practice. Skype. I mean, I could FaceTime him and then zoom in on my no, phone. No, I'm just asking him to find us by name since we're probably only one that was last thing in it. Okay. Ten million bucks a month. Yes. He says, okay. Okay. Bugles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it wasn't his picture. All right, that's guy. why. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I don't see you, but I'm trying. <laughs> Can you see oh, my wait. hand? Anything? Oh, there you are. Hello. Do you see us? Hey. We don't see you yet. Cute that's kid. That's me, but that's old me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, younger me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see us up there in the little corner. Why I, I aren't we seeing... Oh, can you click on that? That's going to turn... He won't be able to see us now. No? So oh, I see. That's not right. Now I can't see you. Now I can see you. Okay. okay. But why can't we see you? That was the whole point of the Skype conversation. Well, well we're not going to be able to see him anyway because he's going to go through the slides. Right. right. Oh, there oh, you there are. are. Okay. Hello. Hi, Michael. Hi. Right. So we did, a, we did a brief... We did a brief introduction... Um, about what it was exactly that you were going to do before we got you on Skype. Um, so, and since we're not live, we know you weren't watching. Um, but I just gave a brief introduction, but you can feel free to just re re replay that, what you're talking about right now. What we're going to talk about tonight. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about the survey results uh, right. that uh, we developed over the last month and some ways to move forward after you have a chance to contemplate those results. Think a little bit about how you want to engage the community going forward. Okay, fantastic. So um, I think Maddie just indicated to me she was going to get the slides. I, I thought she had them loaded, but I guess that's not the case. So um, she's off doing that. So if you wanted to just chat a little bit more about the process, or is that part, of, I can't remember now if that's part of the um, slides. Do you want I'm to talk? I'm just looking over at the slides because they're kind of handled inside of the slides. Right. Uh, but I can tell you that um, maybe it's just some real generalities that aren't covered in the slides. Sure. Um, you know, first of all, I, I thought the response was fine. It was about what I expected. I, I hope for 200 responses we got 177. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the sexiest topic in the world. It's also not a, the kind of topic that um, you know, really motivate some kind of call to action, uh, mm -hmm. which would typically then result in a much higher turnout, if you will, or survey participation. Um, so it's about what I thought we'd get, and I think it's a good first step. Um, most of the time, village governments, especially town, small town governments like yourselves, I don't know that they really um, start in this way. Uh, and so, um, just sort of anecdotally through the comments that were provided, we got a lot of good feedback from folks. Mm -hmm. There were, of course, people who you know, took issue with the construction of the survey or larger issue, but generally speaking, I think there's support for the effort for doing it in this manner, which I think um, the board can uh, appreciate because that's the way the public's supposed to respond. Right. I'm going to just see if I can put a microphone near the computer. I don't know if that's working. Or maybe that already is happening. Can you hear, Captain? Um, can, can, yeah, I just don't know if we can get one of these microphones so we can hear you better. Um, be the speaker. Can you say something again, Michael? Something, something, something. something, something. That's not good enough. Oh, maybe yours. Yeah, maybe you can. Is that going to be feedback? Try again. Uh, sure. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Okay, now it's going to be from this one. Okay, let's see. Okay. Another thing. Okay. Okay, go. Okay. This is Michael, and we're ready to go. A little better, I think. Is it better? Okay. Can you hear it better? Yes? Okay. Yeah, right. you can have your, yours back. Okay. All right, a little bit better. Okay, so now Maddie has the slides. 
That's what we want, right, Michael? Yeah. Um, let me also say that um, one of the things that we uh, articulated to the public, you know, essentially through the survey and I think in talking to Dana over time, oh, good, there are the slides. Um, you know, we went through this constantly trying to um, connect with the public over the idea that this is theirs. This is theirs to move forward or not. Um, we've talked a lot, Dana, Maddie, and I, about the idea that, you know, the government that people get um, should reflect the government that they want. And if people don't want something uh, and they make that clear enough, um, they won't get it. And if they do want something, then we should try to give it to them. So I'm trying to be as agnostic as possible in this process because we want the public to understand that they really drive it. Um, and that's what things like, um, you know, two-way communication are for, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, uh, a little bit ahead of ourselves, and also what referenda are ultimately for as well. So, um, can we start to go through the slides a bit? Okay. I want to skip over this. This is just some introductory stuff that's really more for a broader uh, audience, one that isn't necessarily as complete. And you, so you can go to the next slide. This is what we just talked about. You know, maybe we go forward, maybe we don't. The residents might say to us, um, even post this survey, we like things the way they are. So, um, and today the point is that we um, have to ask ourselves if we're conducting business in the way that the town wants us to. And that's what this process is all about. Um, what slide are you on there? Are you on the methodology slide? It's because it's a little washed out for me to be able to say. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. The methodology. Okay. So just to reconnect in terms of what this survey uh, instrument was, it's a self-select survey online. It's not a phone poll. Um, that means that we have no target demographics. If we do a phone poll, then we're looking at specific gender balance. We're looking at specific uh, voter profiles. We're looking at area of town, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't exist in a self-select poll, which means there's no scientific val validity to it, um, but it does give us a great barometer. It's a great start for the process. Um, we advertised this pretty broadly. Um, first of all, it was open for quite some time through the month of October. Second, we advertised it. Uh, obviously, we sent that postcard out to every single parcel owner within the town. Uh, obviously, we sent out emails. I think you have about 1,800 people signed up, so those emails went out to everyone. Posts to the website and social media, uh, meeting announcements, and uh, the local press releases. So I think we did a pretty capable job of alerting people to the fact that it existed. Um, of course, cost considerations are always at work here because <clears throat> communication can cost money. And we could try to get something into every single household, and that becomes very expensive, uh, particularly if you do it in a repeated way. Next slide, please. And by the way, please jump in if you have any questions as I, as I present. So the, um, this is all survey results. Uh, I do have this caveat here that, um, you know, the results are pre not necessarily predictive of the way in which um, sentiment exists in the community. You know, polls are just a snapshot in time. We know that from watching the way in which um, people who don't, um, don't necessarily look like they're going to get elected to office wind up being there. Polls are fallible. That's really the bottom line, and particularly something like a self-select survey. But it's a great starting point. And in, in this case, you'll see through the people who responded, it's probably more valid in that sense as a barometer of public opinion than um, one that we might otherwise um, ascribe to it. So next slide, please. Let's take a look at that demographic information. We had uh, pretty much gender balance here. And again, you know, we didn't do anything to solicit this. It just turned out that way. So that's terrific, particularly when you look at the differences of opinion, if they exist between men and women. We have um, very close participation between Town Incorporated and Village of Ossining, which is good because, of course, at least one of these choices has to do only with Town Unincorporated. Um, much older set of folks who responded, um, both in terms of their age and for how long they have lived in the community. They're also largely active voters within town elections. And so what we get as a profile here is folks who we would deem 
uh, as influentials. They're people who've lived here a long time, have a sense of the uh, history of the community, uh, the history of issues, and as such, they carry more weight um, in terms of the opinions of others. So that's very important to remember, particularly if we ever get to the point where this actually gets offered up as some kind of a referendum to the public. Uh, next slide, please. Let's take a look at the balance here. Obviously, as I said, gender balance is clear, nearly 50-50 between men and women. Next slide. Age, as you can see, much older, where we had you know, almost 60% of the people who were over the age of 60. Um, and um, a pretty substantial um, amount, about 30 percent, between 49 and 60. So these are active voters, typically. These are people who have been through um, probably multiple issues, probably multiple administrations within the town. It's a very important distinction. Next slide, in terms of area of the town of Ossining, you can see that yeah, as to be expected, the village of Ossining was the large, largest percent percentage. I think it, it was right around 42% or so. Uh, the village was um, much smaller um, of Briarcliff Manor, and Unincorporated came in just a little bit behind the village of Ossining. So again, you never know with self-select surveys what you're going to get. So I was pretty pleased with the fact that we got representation that was fairly robust um, and in line with um, what we'd like to see in terms of expectations based on population and so forth. Um, next slide. How many years have you lived in the town of Ossing? Again, you can see that the profile is about six and ten. We're here more than 20 years, so they've been through the issues, and those issues obviously um, impact their sensibility about this. Because we did have some people, you know, reporting again anecdotally that um, you're aware of issues like this in the past. So let's take a look at this, what we call the satisfaction indices, which is essentially our way of saying, um, hey, people make a value proposition of services versus cost, right? So if we look at the first set, and this is all the voters, this would be the, just go to the next um, slide. Next one. Okay. Um, I, I'd be pretty happy if I was the town uh, board and Dana. We have majority satisfactory or very good excellent in all but two areas of town service, as we asked folks. Those two areas were senior services and town court, but rather than there being negative um, responses, we mostly got, I don't know, about two-thirds in both cases. So people weren't able to register an opinion as to um, their relative level of satisfaction for those services. Tax collection services received the highest combined satisfaction rating at nearly 84%, which I thought was a little funny because <laughs> um, most of the time people grouse about tax collection services. What they really mean is they don't like paying taxes. Here, obviously, what they're saying is your efficiency with collecting taxes is at a pretty high level, so congratulations. Uh, also, highest combined dissatisfaction town property assessment services and yet still, even with that level of dissatisfaction, combined satisfaction um, actually was much higher. I think in looking at the recent history of the town as well, you know, the idea of property assessment, which is generally um, not, a, you know, it's a third rail. We all know that in terms of New York, especially downstate New York. Um, so it's not a surprise to see people register a more negative opinion of something like that. Um, I think one of the most interesting um, findings here, because leadership is so important these days in terms of how people view or report their level of satisfaction. What we see here is that there's very, very strong support for the leadership of the supervisor uh, and the uh, town administration uh, with combined satisfaction at two thirds. I mean, we understand, obviously, there's you know a pretty strong cynicism typically for leadership, especially leadership that sticks around for a bit. And the, um, the ratio between combined satisfaction and combined dissatisfaction is really, really significant. So positive leadership or positive views of leadership typically lead to less reactive contemplation of things like what we're talking about here, which is asking voters to potentially weigh whether or not they'd like to remove some elected offices. If you start from a deficit position with respect to leadership, in other words, if there's a dissatisfaction, 
uh, that's overwhelming here. Obviously, people aren't going to listen as carefully to what you're saying, and they probably reject you out of hand. So what I'm saying here is as a benchmark, we've got a pretty high level of satisfaction for town services, and we've got a pretty excellent appreciation for town leadership as it is currently being delivered. Next slide. Um, you can see that we always ask a question about communication. Um, did we skip one there? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Um, you can see in terms of the dots here, the green dots, this is just reflective of what I uh, just described, where tax collection services, the responses are very, very positive in terms of satisfactory, very good and excellent or combined, uh, as well for the supervisor and town administrative staff. You can see the anomaly there in terms of less than satisfactory for town property assessment services. Although, again, look at how you know, for almost 43% call them satisfactory, another 10 at very good or excellent. So a combined actual majority positive. As well, you can see the two I don't knows and the yellow dots um, for the town senior services and the town court. Nothing that really <clears throat> surprises here to any great extent, at least for, for me, except for the fact that we have a very uniform uh, positive benchmark, which is a good thing. Next slide, please. On the issue of communication, we asked about um, you know, the relative satisfaction or description of the communication practices of the town. And of course, things go hand in hand, right? Leadership and how people define leadership or their satisfaction with it often becomes a communication question. And so what we see here is a really strong level of support for the communication tech, uh, practices of the town. You can see the satisfactory and the very good, excellent, far outstrip the negative indicator. So again, really, really strong foundation for the um, benchmark um, in terms of being able to then take things to the next step. Next slide. We took a little bit of a look at <clears throat> the unincorporated only. And this one was, I would say, equally as um, satisfactory or better in terms of how people articulated their value proposition. No combined dissatisfaction of any note. Highest combined satisfaction for the Highway Department of Sur uh, Department Services for snow and road maintenance, and um, of course, roughly a third professional awareness of building or planning departments, which take it as um, you will. Um, I'm not sure that that's all that meaningful. Next slide just shows us those same bullets. And of course, since the Highway Department um, the office of the highway department or that position of the superintendent is one of the ones that we talk about in this survey. It is interesting to note that uh, in town unincorporated, more than 50% of the folks define their satisfaction indice indices or index as very good or excellent. Um, and so that means they appreciate the service and they might think that you're trying to take something away there. So we have to pay close attention to their concerns uh, if and when we move to the next step. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about the value proposition of taxes. And of course, even though people seem to be relatively satisfied, the benchmark shows that they're satisfied with the quality of services when it comes to taxes. And these things can always be impacted by um, other concerns, grievances, um, or feelings about the level of taxation, broadly speaking, beyond the town. Um, they don't value the services the same way in terms of the taxes that are being paid. Specifically, in the next slide, we look at it. And we say, you know, um, not quite six in ten um, believe that uh, that it's generally a fair amount of taxation. You can see that um, you would think that that for the level that of support that people are registering for town services that we'd see a higher amount of support for the amount of taxes that they're paying for those services it's not a bad finding per se there's just a little bit of a disconnect between how they value the services and what the services cost and as i say you know when you ask about taxes people can get very con confused very quickly about who they're paying their taxes to and exactly um, who's collecting what um, and so everyone bears the grievance. And a good example of that, I think, is towns that um, in some cases collect school taxes often become blamed for school taxes. And of course, we know that there's no correlation other than the, <clears throat> the funneling of the money. In the next slide, you can see that um, 
we the the specific detail here you get 57 percent of the folks who um, identify that the 321 dollars is an average for town general services is generally modest and fair um, but you know almost a quarter are saying that it's more and another eight percent um, say that really there shouldn't even be town services so you've got a pretty solid 30 percent or so of the people there who reject that um, you may think that that's okay um, for now, uh, by the way, those who believe that there shouldn't be town services or town taxes are probably largely connected to those who don't really have an appreciation for those services. And I'm speaking specifically here about the town of Briarcliff Manor, um, where it's evidenced in the cross tabs that there isn't really a connection or perceived value to town services that that preponderance of opinion comes out more uh, from that subgroup. Um, in terms of the actual reactions to the concepts, we looked at whether and why, if you just go to the next slide, we looked at whether and why residents would support the broad notion of modernization and the specific concepts. And, and again, you know, there's some level of detail here. The website is chock full of information. The question is how people are connecting to that because it is new. We're introducing this, um, broadly speaking, without any other preparation, really. But what we can tell you, at least initially, is that this survey shows a fairly amount of a, fair, a fairly good amount of support for modernization and for the two concepts um, and pretty similar reasoning given to both. So let's take a little deeper dive into that, and what it means. First of all, with respect to the issue of whether or not savings, and this, by the way, correlates a little bit, I think, to the tax question. If the um, savings would reduce or the the process would reduce expenditures without knowing any details do people support that um, because we're looking at least initially as to whether or not um, priorities for reducing spending um, actually may supersede um, the services that they're getting and that's really important because now we're asking people to define what's more important to them the cost of the services or the actual services themselves and that's the question of government, right? So we see here that there's an enormous amount of support for the idea of reducing expenditures. I think that's probably something that we're going to hold on to a little bit, at least in terms of the next part of the dialogue with folks, because they're telling us here that they want us to try to reduce expenditures. So the question becomes, how do we do that and not make you feel as if you're losing services because you also value services at a pretty high level that's the dissonance that exists here lower the cost i want i want the same but i don't want to spend the money next slide <clears throat> and again this is all respondents the proposal for eliminating the tax receiver and town clerk positions and replacing them with appointed professional municipal employees you can see a very strong level of support for this. In fact, if you look at the next slide, <clears throat> we asked why, and you can see that um, folks are generally responding by saying, first, they're identifying a, it as um, a political answer. Municipal jobs should not be elected positions. And then we have the two answers that um, are more financially related, those that um, suggest we should um, reduce costs and not impact services and those that it's time we took a closer look. In other words, um, that's an imperative for me. It's money. Please reduce costs. But interesting that the municipal job should not be elected positions was the leading response. By the way, those are the frequencies to the right hand side. So that means those are the number of responses. And again, it's a self-select survey with only 177 responses. So you can see that those frequencies, and it's more important sometimes to look at the frequencies than it is to look at the percentages, because of course the percentages could be a little bit um, taken out of context. You can see the differences there in terms of the responses among those folks. Um, I would say that that's very, very fluid. People could define their answers probably given more than one of these responses. In the next slide, um, oops. We asked if they answered no, why? Why did they um, not want to see these positions um, 
quote, modernized. And we don't have anything that really stands out here. Again, the frequencies are pretty small because we had such an overwhelming number of folks who said that they supported the idea of the modernization. And as a result, um, we have a limited set of responses in terms of objection. Um, I don't trust it would result, it won't result in reduced services. I simply prefer the current personnel organization. Those are almost one and the same in some respects. What I was looking for there was really more that idea of how strong the feeling was about the fact that folks would perceive a loss in services related to this issue. We didn't quite get that here. What we, what we got was more an overwhelming push to go to the next step and, and see if we could you know, add meat to the bone, if you will, about the details. But we don't have at least an initial reaction that suggests <clears throat> an overwhelming fear for the loss of services. And again, I go back to that slide about the relative level of satisfaction for services themselves. That's really what we should be focused on. If people have a pretty good benchmark for the services and you want to take something away in terms of the organization, their natural reaction is going to be that you're going to take away quality. And so that becomes a question of specifics um, in terms of the detail and a question of communication to make sure people understand it. In the next slide, we asked <clears throat> specifically about the highway department superintendent position. And this is, of course, a response that was only offered um, or asked of the unincorporated town residents. And you can see that we had that's about two thirds of the folks respond that they were supportive of the idea of uh, eliminating the position. A little bit less than what we saw uh, in terms of the tax receiver and town clerk, uh, but still appreciable, two thirds of the folks responding. Here's why they said in the next slide that was the case. And again, these numbers sort of mirror what we saw with the town clerk and receiver positions where a little bit more than a third, again, as a leading response, said municipal jobs should not be elected positions. Interesting to me. Um, followed so closely, though, by um, the others. And again, the frequencies here, these are going to even be lower because this is only the subset of the town residents who live in the unincorporated area. So one could very, very easily kind of attack this and say, yeah, but there's almost no difference, right, in terms of some of this reasoning. And I would concede that point very readily because, again, this is not a scientific survey and the frequencies are fairly low. But again, broad sweep, the bigger issue here is that um, there was fairly sizable support um, for the elimination of the position. And the next uh, question uh, about what motivated the no, I uh, would say very similar to what I said to the previous question, the, again, these frequencies are very, very limited and we don't have enough really to draw here. Um, but again, um, even if you look at the leading factor there, I'm going to nudge you toward an understanding that the, the um, cost value proposition and the um, reduction in services to those that are um, appreciated at a higher level is probably the, the biggest challenge here, even though it is fairly muted at, in this initial survey. Finally, um, we took a look at the cross tabulations. Cross tabulations are where we look at specific groups of respondents within the survey to try to find things and suss out, say, you know, what's the difference in terms of the way um, maybe uh, women or maybe people of a certain age uh, or people who live in a certain geographic area might have responded to the questions. Um, there is nothing particularly remarkable to me, and part of that is the um, size of the overall survey, but some broad generalizations here, I will tell you that, um, and probably to no one's surprise, that the village of Briarcliff residents who responded to the survey uh, on the whole demonstrated less awareness of town services, less fervent support, and less support for paying town taxes um, and greater support for consolidation of services. They are, I think in a word, not really the audience here. In other words, um, they aren't connected and probably to a person um, don't really care about their status as members of the town. Uh, so that is not really the significant audience of the three. Among the three, uh, the young incorporated residents demonstrated the highest level of rejection of the town clerk, town receiver of taxes consolidation concept 
but there was still an overwhelming support. So you can imagine town of uh, Briarcliff Manor residents um, are overwhelmingly in support of getting rid of stuff and not paying taxes. Um, unincorporated residents have the highest degree of concern, but it's still the highest of a very low amount. And that is a distinction that may or may not be interesting. We'll see as the process moves forward. And the next slide just um, identifies the cross tab in terms of how people value their tax investment here. And I put two red marks on here. One is that within the village of Briarcliff Manor, um, we had almost 30% of the people saying that uh, their tax contribution is more than they should pay for services provided. And we also had almost 20% of the people say that they don't believe there should be uh, town taxes or town services. And so that just underscores what I said about the fact that the village of Barcliffe Manor residents don't really have that same connection to the town of Austin. Finally, there are 98 comments of the 177 respondents that uh, took part in the survey. Um, there was nothing specifically correlated. People could tell us anything they want. I will, um, I have included those comments in the written report, and I will tell you that there is no specific correlation of those comments. Um, I did not quantify those comments in any way because it's not really worthwhile to do that. The comments, generally speaking, are just off the cuff reactions. Some of them are completely meaningless, um, like, do you have any comments? And the response is no. <laughs> Some of them um, congratulate, and a fair number, congratulate the town for embarking on this. Some of them take issue with the survey methodology. Uh, some of them introduce extraneous issues like assessment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're there in the interest of full transparency, but they offer no meaningful perspective um, with regard to the survey. So that's where we stand right now in terms of these initial results. And again, I look at this from the broadest possible perspective. I have now a barometer of opinion. And the opinion tells me that, generally speaking, the body that authorized this, that being you, has a question in front of it as to whether or not it wants to take the next step. And to me, the next step is really bringing these results to the public. So the recommendation here would be that we kind of identify these things and package them up. We'd add them to the website, of course. We would bring them to the broader community by alerting every household um, that the survey results have been posted. And then more importantly, what we would do if it is the board's desire to move forward based on these results is we would invite folks in for a dialogue on this. In other words, you call a public meeting and you go through this presentation and you hear what people have to say in person now, as opposed to through the survey methodology, through the ether, if you will, of the website. And you pull back from that after that meeting and then you say to yourself, now we have a decision to make. Do we move forward and then offer this to the public in the form of um, some kind of a referendum or not. Um, you're not going to get something that um, is a completely error-free, um, absolutely 100% guidepost. You know that as people who have run for office and who sit at this table today, you're looking for indications that lean more way one way than another. And so where we've started this process is that you have a significant amount of support, in my estimation, through this survey from a group of influential, older, um, more informed by virtue of their history with the town, group of residents. And they're telling you that you should keep going here. And so I think that's where we begin our conversation is where do we go next? Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Um, Okay, let's turn off the screen and turn the light back on, maybe. What? No, I know, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I'm trying to figure out the feedback now. Maybe we can... Yeah, we're getting a little feedback. Maddie, can you just move that? Now that you turned up the volume on that, I don't think we need this microphone near. Or can you just turn off that microphone? Yeah. Okay, see if that helps. Okay. All right, is that better, Michael? 
Very good. And can you see us now? You still can see us? We can't Absolutely. see. Absolutely. All right, I have my back to you because I can't see you, but you can see us, so that's fine. Um, okay, so. Board. Would you like to comment at all on these, on the results of this survey? And or uh, are you prepared to talk about next steps? I mean, I would think that the next step for us would be to, to communicate to the public that um, as we're doing this evening, we have now a videotape of this meeting um, with the results of the survey. We post the results of the survey with the slides that Michael has just presented to us um, for the public to take a look at, uh, to review, and then schedule a time when we can um, host a town hall meeting, I think, about this. Yeah and see if we can get people to come to library and to talk with us about this and to sort of get another barometer of if um, we have enough um, engaged public to think about moving to another place with, with uh, our suggestions for um, uh, re reducing the government, size of government and looking for ways to be more efficient. Does anybody have any thoughts on the matter or want to add anything? Will we get a written copy of his results? Yeah. 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 I meant we as the board. What is that? Two that doesn't sound great. Right. <laughs> I know. I think it's a video game I played as a child. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, I'd, like, I'd love to be able to read the comments and stuff, but I do think we should go forward with a town hall meeting and engage the public some more. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Can I make a suggestion? It might be useful if you could. Can you hear? Oh, I don't know. Just to, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if it might be useful to have Michael's analysis, it's a video of his analysis linked to the, the results so that somebody can tap on that and listen to the explanation as well. That would be great. So we can. Before yeah. they come to the meeting. Maybe we just like tap the link to, to the YouTube, but like, like at such and such a start time or yep. something like that. That's a good idea. Okay. Fantastic. So we're so Michael. Thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. That was a pleasure. And uh, we'll yeah. talk a little bit more about next steps. Okay, great. So we'll talk about next steps and in terms of figuring out the date and how we want to get the message out to the public that we're going to have a town hall meeting um, <coughs> with enough time for people to think about it, to have a chance to look at the YouTube video of you explaining the results, and then to come prepared, hopefully, to the town hall with some sorts of comments to uh, talk to the board about, right? Sounds good. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your detailed analysis and for taking this project on from uh, your, your Skype uh, den over there. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we look forward to the continuing the public engagement on this issue. And this we'll initiative. Meet the meeting person, that would be great. A little bit less feedback next time. Okay, great, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. All right. So that was interesting. Um, so our final conversation tonight, and it's interesting that we don't have a crowd because we've had a crowd for so many of these other um, evenings, is our leaf blower legislation. Is it possible the village is also talking about it? The, the village is talking about it. Um, I did take a look at their... Um, proposed local law and it looks a lot like where we started with ours and we've kind of gone through a number of different iterations um, and uh, uh, Christy who had originally drafted the um, lo local law and she'd given us a spreadsheet of you know sort of where we were in terms of what other municipalities had and just to remind everybody I think whether 12 or 14 municipalities in Westchester that have uh, leaf blower laws um, and regulations that restrict the amount of time that um, they can be used to a period that is not the summer, basically. Um, we're not the first, um, we're not the last, uh, but we're somewhere in between. Um, so some of the issues that had come up that people took exception to that were in the most recent draft um, of our uh, local law, um, people took exception to the uh, exemption that basically said 
we don't have to abide by it, schools wouldn't have to abide by it, etc. And most people said, if you know you're going to put in place this local law, especially like why and why would you want to exempt schools, especially if you know it's for health reasons and you're and you know that has a negative impact on children because you're you know exempting schools and here you are blowing those leaf blowers around. Um, I don't think anybody really took exception to the cemeteries. So one of the and one of the suggestions that had come up had been to only exempt cemeteries and pavement slash impervious surfaces if the blower was being operated at half speed. How would you enforce something like that? I guess would be my question. Like half speed versus full speed. How would you even pavement know? Pavement versus, I mean, it's just, I think it makes it more complicated and even harder to enforce, and it's already kind of hard to enforce. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let's go backwards. You all were here for these many conversations. Before I start sort of going through this list of the analysis that, that Chrissy had put together, does anybody just want to chime in where, where you think we are and what you think we, where we should be going with this? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, I've thought about this a lot because it, it was an education to me because I didn't really know how, how um, you know, how bad leaf blowers were for the environment. So I think it would be good to use, you know, not use them at all eventually. Um, but in talking to a lot of different people and, and even evaluating, you know, personal use of leaf blowers, um, I, I'm really concerned that... Um, some of the legislation, and, and even when I hear that, that um, in talking to people who use leaf blowers for their livelihood, enforcing the stuff is almost impossible. Um, and not that that should necessarily be a reason, but I feel to a certain extent the leaf blowers are required not because landscapers are people who don't care about the environment, but because that's the standard that we, we hold dear in terms of the green lawns and everything. And if there is not a demand from consumers themselves, we're putting the onus on people who make their livelihoods that don't really have right now um, very viable alternatives that won't necessarily cost homeowners more, which is another problem. So I'm not pro leaf blowers, but I am worried that this, you know, in, in doing this, it, it, I think it's more complicated than just saying no leaf blowers because one of the things that um, I really think has to happen is um, huge education and, you know, maybe really shifting the burden to people who's, who are letting leaf blowers be used because they're, they're not willing to tolerate a few extra leaves on their lawn or they're not willing to um, look at that impact. Um, you can um, have people not, um, you know, you can ask your landscaper not to blow your leaves and they can just mow your leaves. And that's a good way for them to, and any mower will mulch. It doesn't have to be a specific mulching mower. Um, you can, um, you know, my, my concern is if, if people are still demanding their lawns be pristine, if people are still saying, I, I need to have this perfect green lawn and they're not, we, we're not educating to how damaging that is for the environment, then I, I don't know how you're going to solve the problem. So I think it goes beyond just banning leaf blowers. I think there has to be a shift in, in consumer demand for leaf blowers. Well, to your point, and I don't know if the board would want to consider this, is that a number of the municipalities that have these provisions provide for um, issuing the violation to the property owner. I think to a certain extent that's where the onus is, mm -hmm. more so than it is to the landscaper themselves. So um, so a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that, um, and I think I forwarded it to all of you, I had received with some correspondence that um, Mayor Garrity had had with somebody from Yonkers who had been um, very involved in the initial Yonkers leaf floor legislation. I think they were one of the first. Um, the reason that Yonkers had actually um, imposed restrictions on leaf floors was 100% for health reasons. 
it wasn't for noise. It wasn't for the environment. It was almost um, an ec economic justice or environmental justice issue more than anything else. Um, and they, what kicked it off was a number of health experts coming in to say, you're negatively impacting children. You know, these leaf blowers, the, the level at which the, you know, fumes or exhaust is, is um, leaving the leaf blowers is at the height of which kids are. And, um, and I just thought that was interesting. We really didn't start. And I know that the village also had a number of health experts in um, to meet with them. We, we didn't actually start with that. Um, but that was the impetus for, that drove Yonkers to institute this many years ago. And um, some of the rebuttal that, we, that I learned just from reading the um, response from the person from Yonkers was that, um, I mean, they basically said that a lot of the fear that the um, landscaping industry had posed was um, more than reality. Again, as this, the issue of um, enforcement is always going to be out there. And as we've spoken about, um, you know, a lot of the enforcement does come from um, not because somebody's, you know, because somebody's, you know, the police are roaming around looking for people to cite you know, with violations or, or whatever, um, on Saturdays and Sundays from June to, um, October, but from people who are complaining, like, I don't like the smell. I, you know, this is an, an imposition on me. It's like, you know, secondhand smoke almost, right? Like, why do I need to have that? I don't do that. I don't, I, you know, I don't blow all my leaves and spend all day with lots of machines on my lawn. Um, I think that um, I think that that's it's critical for us to consider that as well, um, even though it hasn't necessarily been our focus of, of discussion. Um, I think that it's um, something that we should think about. Now, probably in the town, it's not quite the same as it might be in the village. But again, as the village is considering taking this up, and specifically for gas-powered leaf blowers, and we do know electric leaf blowers are effective. And remember, we are not banning leaf blowers during leaf blowing season. We are banning leaf, I mean, during leaf season. We're, mm -hmm. we're banning leaf blowers for the summer, essentially, spring and when, when they're used for peripheral. And we have heard absolutely that they are used for other things. They're used to spread, spread pesticides. They're used to clear fertilizers. Some of these things sound worse, not better to me than, you know, that, and again, there might be an occasion, and I think somebody brought up, like if you have West Nile virus, you know, when we would have a need or a, or a requirement even by the county that they say, you know, okay, we're going to be, you know, spraying and we need to spray and, and sometimes leaf blowers are used to help that effort. So for public health reasons or, or something of that nature, we might have the opposite to consider um, using or having the ability to use leaf blowers, obviously in emergencies, if there's big storms and you need to clear um, in the, you know, during this season. We're not talking about it during the majority of the year. We're talking about it for the minority, one quarter of the year, basically. So, so it, but yeah. if the issue is the health and well-being of people, mm -hmm. right? And you're really going, like, if you, you follow that to the logical conclusion, you take the time when they're being used the least and say, don't use them now, as opposed to the time when they could really pose the most damage is when they're being used in the highest concentration. So I understand what you're saying, but it still doesn't seem to me to be the, you know, the, you know, that you have so many different issues. Mm -hmm. And my only concern is that the, you know, the leaf blowers that are being used are regulated to the degree that the law provides for them to be regulated right now. I mean, it's not like people are using necess I, I don't know, but like illegal leaf blowers. Um, what? If we don't create a like the leaf blowers are already regulated, like they have some regulations oh, on your okay. you know, no. so it's not like people are using something that they shouldn't be using. These have essentially been approved uh, for public use, knowing all these things. I'm not saying it's on it, it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. But 
I'm not sure, like, what, what's the end goal here? Is the end goal, if the end goal is to, you know, really put pressure on manufacturers mm -hmm. to change the way they manufacture, like, I do think that has to, like, we have to be looking at the bigger picture here. Otherwise, we're taking leaf bulbers out of mm -hmm. use in a time when they're used the least anyway. So I'm not really sure how that really helps anybody from a health point of view or an environmental point of view. I mean, I think that... Again, I think there's sort of three main thrusts here. There's the um, health thrust. There's the um, noise and sort of whatever quality of life. And then there's the environmental implications, right? So those are the sort of the main things that are sort of working against these gas-powered leaf blowers. And then the reason that you would impose um, a ban is to at least, at the very least, begin an education campaign. Now, yes, you could begin an education campaign without the ban, but you, but by putting in place a ban for a, a specific amount of time, and it, again, it isn't a, it's not a lot of a time, you're, this is now an impetus to start raising the bar on education and saying to your community, listen, we take this seriously. There are very serious health implications of, the, of these use. And then you start, you know, again, communicating with your public about what it is that they need to do and how it is that they need to comply with your regulations. So the con consumer demand drives use of leaf blowers. It's not that the, the, the landscapers themselves don't drive it. It's consumer demand for using, you know, having your lawn a certain way and, and having your leaves blown because that, that's how you were enculturated to believe that you, what you should do with your lawn or whatever. Um, so I do think that the onus is on the consumer that's requiring it if they're not willing to look at other alternatives. So to Steve's point, I do think that there should be a penalty imposed on homeowners and, and people who are using leaf blowers. Okay, but I mean, I get that there's consumer demand and that's that's a piece of it, but the other, you know, to, to drive industry, but there's also, uh, there's also just like we- Well, why can't wait, you wait, do wait, both? Let me finish though. my sentence, let me finish my yeah. sentence. But there's also, you know, our, desire to improve our environment and as and having the ability to do so from just like we we um uh, you know adopted the um community choice aggregation that's um you know again we're saying okay everybody we're going to move from you know point a to point b because we want to reduce our carbon emissions as a community so we're taking a positive step in that direction um and we're going to help and increase demand for other alternative forms of... My point is a more effective way. If more people understood the damage of leaf blowers, right. and it's not really the onus of a landscaper to you know, promote that or not, that the onus is on educating people. So the more I know, if I have kids and I have somebody blowing, you know, blowing my leaves in the summer or whenever, or I mean, I guess there's no leaves, but whatever, blowing the lawn clippings and my kids are out playing, and now I'm more aware of what the consequences are, I think that's actually going to put you in a much more advantage, advantageous position to eradicate leaf blowers or get the industry to move on more um, safe ways to do that than penalizing, just penalizing the the landscapers. Well, I don't have any problem if we if we want to penalize home, the res. The, I'm just uh, saying that that's to me where you're you're the 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 consumer education is going to benefit right. most, and I'm not sure if you get that when you do because then then I don't even know as a consumer. I'm hiring somebody to do my lawn, right. and he has to use different stuff. Okay. I don't know what he has so, to do. I'm sorry. So maybe I just don't understand. So you're just you're agreeing with Steve that we put. I think that if you really place, want us, if we wanted to that would be imposed on the on the property owner um i'm sure i'm not going to be particularly popular for saying this but yeah if you want to really change it mm -hmm. and you want to make people aware so that right. even because now you're taking it out of the mm -hmm. the the you know if you're following this really closely or you're paying <clears throat> attention to what your landscaper mm -hmm, does sense. then you mm -hmm. don't even know that you're making these choices the landscaper it's being put on the landscaper but there's really no onus on the landscaper to educate right his his, <coughs> his or her customers mm -hmm. about you know best practices environment you know that's not really right. so to me if you want the best way to get people to stop doing things is point point out how bad it is for right. them or how bad it is for their lawn mm -hmm. so that's a way to me to make it more effective it. even though i don't think i made myself so particularly are we doing popular. an education campaign to 
Well, so you're saying, well, I mean, I I, to what me, funding what you'd have that. to do, you'd have to put, we'd have to put in place an education campaign that would go along with this. Right. Like that would have to be our plan is that not only were we educating, you know, property owners, but we would also, you know, and, and, and a lot, that's what a lot of communities have done. Certainly Bedford 2020 is, has taken that on. I know that I, I think actually Tarrytown recently had some, had a public uh, forum for landscapers and, you know, for, um, for property owners. Or you know anybody who has you know takes care of property. What you may want to do is is provide that the violation can be issued to the owner and or the operator, um, just so everybody knows there's a penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously you have to do some education because, as as you said, uh, I may not know that my my lawn guy is is using a leaf blower. But if I get a notice telling me that if he uses it during these these days and hours, that I'm I may get a fine. I'm gonna have a conversation with him about it, or yeah, I should yeah, anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. I think so. That's a that's a good suggestion. Well, would help in the enforcement because I don't even think right. most people are home when their landscapers are there. And the other thing I think that Yonkers had put in was like they, you know, first you get a warning before you get any kind of fine. I mean, I don't know if you get well, one you, you one warning or two warnings, but you know, you get. <coughs> I'm just. I think this is. Fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the warning is prohibited fine too. from June first through September. This is Yonkers through September 30th of each year during times of emergency caused by storm. Commissioner of Public Works may declare a temporary moratorium on the operations of this provision. I'm just going to read you because it's sim it's very simple. This is Yonkers. Commissioner of Public Works through the Office of the City Clerk may, in his discretion upon application, grant temporary special permits for the temporary operation of one or more gas-powered leaf and garden blowers otherwise subject to the section to accommodate special circumstances, including but not limited to remediation of abandoned or neglected properties or the cleanup of temporary work sites and shall charge and collect a fee of $35 for each permit so granted. This is also something we talked about. Except as otherwise provided, violations of the section shall be a class two offense as defined in chapter one, general provisions, penalties, penalties for offenses, lesser included offenses of this code. And I can't, I think in that one of those, there, it indicated that there was some sort of a, a warning before any penalty was imposed. So then a paving company or a pesticide application would go and get a permit for that one day? Potentially, yes. Well, from what I understand, there's some, some pesticides and I don't know if whatever that require right. that require like by law a, a leaf blower to to administer them that's what right. I was told so, so they had mentioned at the at one of our public hearings that to clear fertilizers that the state requires the clearing of fertilizer after it's from, applied so it's not from so, the walkways yeah, from of that nature so again that would be something that would be um, theoretically exempt and again we could require that that be done at half speed or something like that you could you know I, I mean I'm not look again I'm not like pro uh, you know putting the stuff out there I just think it's important that if we do thing that we that that it's not punitive that it's it's done in the way obviously a fine is punitive but that it's done in a way that that is really exemplifies why it's for the greater good not just for you know kids in the community but the people who are actually doing the work themselves and everything else that ultimately puts more pressure on the industry mm -hmm. and they the, you know if you look at things because you 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 have used the analogy of smoking and stuff but cigarettes haven't been banned it's just more and more like over time people couldn't smoke in public places because of the effect it had on other people so again that's why i feel like if if i'm using a leaf blower on my lawn and my neighbors want are you know more concerned about you know or maybe they have kids or pets or whatever then i'm making a choice that does have an impact on somebody else mm -hmm. so it's to me it's more my responsibility than the person i hired to do its responsibility mm -hmm. no i'm That's, with you on that I, I really i think that makes sense so we're going to lead by example by having our parks and schools do same also correct like we wouldn't exempt the parks and schools we would exempt the cemetery just because it's particular yeah. one thing i need to look at on the issue of schools okay because i know for example under zoning schools are exempt from your zoning laws mm -hmm. i'm not sure whether or not we can impose this restriction on the schools we're gonna have to take a look at that okay sure and um what else was i was gonna say exceeding individual lots 
And we're not going to, again, the, the lot size isn't going to change anything. That was another thing that had come up. Um, that it's yeah, we're, we're moving towards either you can do it general, or you can't. Right, exactly. Again, similar to what I just read, which is very simple. I think a lot of people don't understand that it's only for the summer months, too, because right. we've gotten the things about the snow blowing and the things like that, which would not be prohibited during the, right. you know. Um, but you could even just by just, you know, instructing your your landscaper to just not blow or, you know, only do it if, if you have so many leaves on the driveway that it's becoming a, you know, a, a safety risk or something. Mm -hmm. And in a way that's less work for them anyway so that to me i don't know it seems like a, a better way to drive the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do in the first place because mm -hmm. i don't know okay so the other thing is if we do have this um you can apply for a permit right now it's going to have to come to the town supervisor which doesn't seem to make the most sense and we talked about if it would go to either the building inspector potentially or highway superintendent um I, we were kind of thinking building inspector might make the most sense um if they wanted to have a, you know needed something special for one of these um the inspector himself or the department i think he would be the one who had to make the decision okay. so like if you were going for a building permit you would normally it's like it would be right. a, a similar process so it makes sense to Go to the building inspector or a tree if you want to take a have, yeah. to, have to take a tree down or something like that keep the process yeah. similar yes exactly yeah um okay and is there anything else that anybody wants to talk about except and do you have anything else that you can think of the only thing yeah. The only other thing I saw was that there was a provision for the supervisor after a, a severe weather event to make a determination about whether or not to extend that. And I'm wondering, again, whether that might be better uh, with either the building inspector or the highway department uh, because they may have a better sense of what's actually going on around town. But that's obviously your call. I don't have a problem with leaving that for the supervisor. I think the supervisor would have to know anyway what was going on and if you're involved in emergencies which we are regularly as far as you know what's happening and dealing whether you're dealing with con ed or you know any kind of weather emergencies or anything like that we we have to know yeah again i'm just throwing it out because i saw a number of other communities don't do it on the mayor or the supervisor but they have like a department of public works yeah, yeah. or a manager yeah. right. or administrator exactly. but we don't have right. i mean that's the thing and we could we could give it to highway okay. theoretically um Seem like I'd that rather it sit with you. Hmm? I'd rather it sit with you. Yeah. Okay. I don't feel surprising. strongly either way. Okay. Well, let's leave it there. We can always shift it if need be. Um, is that it? Are we good? Do we feel like we're all on the same page now for this? At least for the next round, and then we'll have another round of people yep. coming and screaming and yelling at us. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have... Maybe at me in particular now, so... <laughs> we'll see. So anyway, so the next would be that we would have a public hearing on November 13th, which is coming this coming Tuesday. We're going to be at the courthouse. Um, I think we... Uh, do we have an executive session material for tonight? Where do we decide? We have two. Okay, so um, I'm going to close the meeting. Before I do, I'd ask that we have... I, I have a motion to go into executive session uh, for personnel. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right. So let me just grab the last little mention that I have to discuss, um, which is that as a reminder, our town offices will be closed on Monday, November 12th in observance of Veterans Day, which falls on Sunday this year. Please do take some time over the weekend um, to think about the act of service and to thank those in your life who have served or continue to serve in any branch of our military. We appreciate your sacrifice, their sacrifice, and their dedication to our freedoms. Um, with that, thank you very much, and we will see you all next week at our regular uh, meeting on November 13th at the Courthouse 8688 Spring Street. Have a great night, everybody.